certainly a dirty word right here, I can tell you that. And still is, in Gaston County. And always will be, I guess. It was on Labor Day in 1934 that I witnessed the closest thing that this country has had to a revolution. The General Textile Strike was one of the largest strikes in American history. It was the culmination of years of homegrown organizing and protest. For many Southern workers, it was the first time they had raised their voices as citizens to challenge the control of the mill owners. I never remember the strike being brought up in school. It was like, um, it was not to be mentioned. It was just like everybody was trying to keep everything quiet. Maybe it was just the, you know, just trying to get away from the sadness, what they had gone through. Never mentioned. Never mentioned. After that happened down there, Union was never mentioned again. Until they know they killed him. They were afraid, and they still are afraid. understand why my dad didn't tell me. He could talk about the war and, and talk about people being blown to bits, but he couldn't talk about his neighbors being killed. And it's like somebody trying to hide a dirty secret about their family. Like they're ashamed of what happened to their families. They ought to be proud of them. They stood up when other people wouldn't. Yes, I was over there. I took a man's hat off his head, laying on the ground, fanned him till he died. The breath lifting. But I ain't got no more to say into it. I've been trying to forget about all of that. And it's just bringing it all back up. So it's a hush thing. It's a keep quiet thing. Let's don't pull out our our skeletons out of the closet. Let's leave, let, let sleeping dogs lie. I would imagine even a relative, me going to her and saying, Granny, talk to me. You know, what is this about a union? Her memories are so frightening of the periods that she's gone through that I'm not burdening a younger generation with the horror I went through. It's the quietest thing I've ever known. I don't know. They may think that it will give their children a hard time. I think some people suffered over it. We lost a strike. I think that hurts some. And organized labor in the South, in the whole, gets a dirty word. Troublemakers and scores of arrests marked the walkout. I might have been in that crowd. The crisis was growing braver as these films were wretched. It's familiar looking, but I don't know any of them. I can't recognize any of them. But it brings back a lot of memories. I was raised on a farm in Carroll County. My daddy had always said that he wouldn't leave the farm, and he particularly didn't want to go to a cotton mill. 
That wasn't his dream. It was quite different from being your own boss and having a boss over you. And he had never had that, you see. He was a hard worker. And so he taught us to work. And I can remember the time when we had a lot of cotton to pick that year. And he would tease us and tell us to try to keep up with him, you know. He'd made good crops for several years. Well, on until I was, I'll say 15, I believe I was about 15 years old. Anyway, it was in 19 and uh, 26. And in 19 and 26, the bow weevils came along. I don't know how long they'd been around, but that's the year that they got my daddy's crop. When my daddy left the country, the only choice he had was to go to a cotton mill, and it broke his heart. We moved to the mill village. We had electric lights and running water, and I thought that was heaven on earth. That was the happiest I ever was when I didn't have to go dip, draw a bucket of water out of the well. And we could just turn on that faucet, and I just thought we were rich. I just knew we were rich. It took me a long time to think that we wasn't as happy as well off as I thought we were. My father remembered hiring these families that came from the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee, and they needed the help in, in running the mills. And as the textile industry grew in the South, they had to have more employees. So from the mountains of North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee came uh, many, but those people would not come unless you had a job for their mother and their father and their grandpa and their grandma. You had to provide jobs for all of those. So it was a, it was a family type of environment, and I think it was the type of environment that the workers liked and enjoyed. They felt comfortable in it. All the surrounding uh, at the mill and uptown belonged to Cannon Mill, belonged to Mr. Cannon. The whole city belonged to Mr. Cannon. Everything was owned by the company, all the stores, the drugstore, bank, all, every building was owned by the company, even the doctor's office. Superintendent had control of the mill stores, and this is where people had to go buy their things, their groceries, their clothes. Um, they would be so heavily in debt, uh, they would owe their, their whole paycheck to him from week to week. Everything fell back to the mill, the lifeline of everything that those people lived went back to the Chicola mill. There just weren't any black women in the mill at that time. They did not hire black women in the mill. And we worked for the people that worked in the mill, the, the mill villages. And we took care of their house, took care of the children and did their work while they worked in the mill. That's what, that was our occupation at that time. They didn't have to pay them very much. They just practically raised the children. You could take your black hands and you could stir it in their dough or in their foods. And uh, you could take your black body and lay in the bed with the child and, and protecting it. But you couldn't come in their front door, right? You weren't worthy to come in, your fr in their front door. There was a sense that a new administration was coming in and that would bring a new world into bearing. We were trying to get over the depression and Roosevelt was our gleam of hope with what he called a new deal. And people said we got to do better than we have done. Roosevelt's theme song was, Happy Days Are Here Again. Well, we took him at his word, Happy Days Are Here Again. And all the way through, when we went to the polls to vote for him, 
We were all singing, happy days are here again because Roosevelt's going in. When Roosevelt got a little box here. Yeah, let me find my union book. Here it is. Now, this is my union book that they gave me when I joined the union. And uh, we were just trying to get the union then in the mill. And when I got that union card, I was I proud of it. Well, we were debutized. You know, that's my daddy there on the, on the left-hand side. And uh, they debutized them to keep the union out. The mill owners got them uh, ammunition for their guns. And these men would stay at the mill to protect the mill property. During the strike, we had so much criticism. And I felt that some of our criticism was coming from people who really didn't understand what the strike was about. So I wrote a letter to the editor of the Knoxville News Sentinel in September of 1934. We're not out on strike just because the other fella is. We're out to eliminate sweatshops starvation wages, and stretch-out systems that have no place in this country. And we're willing to make... On the mill where they shot. That whole thing there, where they shot them people, that goes to show a murder, murder to kill a union. Nobody was guilty killing themselves. And they, they knew who done the shooting. They knew who done the shooting. They didn't care. Hi, I'm Mike Cavanaugh. You're watching another edition of Cavanaugh's Corner, our labor talk show in southern Maine on public access television. Uh, we've been watching the film, The Uprising of 34, which has been broadcast on uh, public television around the country here in June of 1995, talking about an uh, important historical event that occurred in uh, American labor history in 1934. And uh, watching this film with me this evening is a group of uh, current day textile workers, members of our union. And uh, I'd like to just uh, introduce uh, for our viewers uh, Paulette Gayu from uh, West Point Stevens here in Biddeford, and Pete Lamontagne, oh. West Point Stevens, Tom Farda, and Sharon Britton, Hi. and Danny Britton. These five are uh, uh, descendants, in a way, as really in a way we all are, of the uh, strikers uh, that we saw in the film uh, back in 1934. And uh, the idea here this afternoon was to, was to really preview this film. This is a, a film that's been in progress for six years. Uh, on a previous edition of our show, we had a chance to interview the producer, George Stoney, and uh, George, it was really the producer's suggestion that we might want to look at this film uh, with a group of people who uh, come from this industry, who are, you know, union people, and uh, really sort of talk about reactions. And I'm going to turn my attention away from the viewers and, and to my guests, uh, really to sort of talk about this. This is the first time that you've all seen this film. It's, uh, you, you've got a week's preview on the rest of the country who will be seeing this uh, next Tuesday night. Uh, but I guess I'd first just kind of like open it up and, and ask anybody whether, you know, anything you saw up here uh, was, was this so, it, information you already knew? Was it all old hat or was there something uh, that struck you about that film? And feel I, free. Really, I heard about that a, while, a long time ago. My father told me about that. So, yeah. My father was in the uh, Teamsters Union at that time. Uh -huh. And uh, he used to tell me a lot about that. He, he remembered that. Is that right? Yeah, my father was born in 1910, so he was in the labor uh, movement for quite a while. Okay. And uh, it, today the unions are not the same as like they were back then. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, people just don't stick together like they used to. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think they feel it is bad for them. They don't, it is. they don't feel it can the work. 1934 was a lot worse for them mm -hmm. than it is for the people of 1995. Uh -huh. uh, I think they do a lot now. Well, okay. Tommy, you mentioned though you you said your father was a union person. Oh, uh, oh. 
back in the 30s, uh, and, and you heard about the general strike and the textile strike of 34. Do you think you're rather unique in that regard, though? Don't you, I mean, yeah, I do, because uh, a lot of people weren't, uh, weren't even aware of that. Mm -hmm. you know? they, uh, parents uh, went in the uh, labor movement at that time, probably. My father was, yeah. and uh, his father. Yeah. They were all involved in that. Huh. Who else, uh, uh, maybe who, who didn't have a parent or grandparent who told you about this? Um, well, Paulette, how about you? Is this something that you knew anything about before? I knew a little bit, but not as bad as it is. Uh -huh. And I seen, you know, I just heard more or less through my husband how they strike in Canada during the union and everything from his father and his grandfather. Uh -huh. You know, like the dirty strikes and things right. like that. Right. But now today, how it's changed. Uh -huh. Okay. I, I, from speaking of myself, uh, I didn't have any family that was union because they were mostly northern Maine mm -hmm. farmers. But uh, what I found unique about this, well, at the beginning it said United Textile Workers. I always knew this Textile Workers Union of America, so that's something I learned there. I didn't mm -hmm. even know at that mm -hmm. time it was United Textile Workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously the struggles they had in those days uh, was really, really unreal. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have today, you know, like Tom was saying, is, you know, people have to see, view this film, actually, essentially, to look and see what went on in those days mm -hmm. and make them really, you know, think, hey, you know, I've got it made today. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm lucky I have a union. I'm lucky I can keep, keep going as it is. There's no such thing as you could see. There's no contracts in those days. And it was outright sad, mm -hmm. you know, as I, as I viewed it. And those poor southern workers uh, going through what they had to go through and endure, mm -hmm. you know, makes me feel real lucky today that I belong to the union mm -hmm. and I have a contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, one thing that Danny mentioned, uh, you know, that uh, his family was from northern Maine. Why uh, did they come to this area, Danny? They, they were looking for work, right? That's they, correct. They were leaving the farms and coming in the area looking for work. Mm -hmm. they, they, yes, they migrated down here, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. That essentially that reason, you know, there's a uh, living wages. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this is what we saw in the film. That's right. That's, that's exactly what we saw in the film, right? People dri thing. driven off the farm by mm -hmm. uh, you know, conditions, both the economic conditions and, uh, um, you know, natural... A bad crop, and, oh, you know, they right. said, well, you know, they just needed to make uh, a living, so they, they migrated to the areas where the mills were, mm -hmm. which is the same thing uh, with my parents. Uh, they were from Canada, well, my, my mother was from Canada, and they came to the area, to, you know, to work in the mills. Mm -hmm. They were loaded on these big trains, and they just came in the area and, and found work. Mm -hmm. Established, uh, you know, uh, a family setting, and, uh, you know, back then, uh, they had row houses down on Water Street, and down on Gooch Street, where they would, put, you know, put the people up, you know, and everything was owned by the mill. and. Uh, in this mm -hmm. film here, if you were blackballed, uh, you couldn't go downtown in the store and get a job because mm -hmm. they were owned by the company, mm -hmm. much like it was over here. Yeah. Uh, well, did you hear stories, Pete, about either the strike? Because the strike of '34, I mean, this the film concentrated mostly on what happened in the South, but mm -hmm. but this was going on within the textile industry through through New England as well. I knew there was uh, in in Lewiston, Auburn at the time. They were out on strike, in, right. you know, this Bitterford period too. in Bitterford as well. Yeah, they were. I um, believe 1936. I believe there was a, there was a big strike uh -huh. in this little one of the pepper mill. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I'm told. Uh, but is that is that anything? I mean, you know, you had uh, your parents. Do you say your grandparents who were here in the mills? My, well, uh, all my you know, my mom and dad, and my grandmother and great grandmother and great grandfather, they all worked <coughs> in the mill. Okay. Uh, as well as uh, my sisters. My uncles, my aunts, uh -huh. uh, we all worked here in the mill. Okay. Uh, at one time or another. Uh, and, and is this the history of the of the of the struggle to build the union? Was that something that was that was taught here? I mean, is it? Did you learn that growing up as a child, or any of any? My dad told me uh, he was, you know, uh, asked to go house to house to collect union dues. You know, uh, whatever. The people could afford it mm -hmm. at that time, which is uh, you know pennies, and uh, he he was telling me that you know he he remembers going uh, to 
various houses, you know, that the people had already signed the mm -hmm. union cards mm -hmm. to solicit money for the uh, for the cause, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how I learned about it, you know, mm -hmm. you know. and that was back in that time. Mm -hmm. The only way I learned by it was right in the mill itself from other union workers, mm -hmm. past presidents, old Pete, uh, Don Dillette, mm -hmm. told me about struggling times back in the early days. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of it myself, you know, and because I didn't have family, it was uh, union orientated, so. so. So people have picked up, I mean, everybody who said that you heard, you know, from your husband, you know, from your parents, from your father, from people in the mill, but, I mean, one of the things that struck me about this is here, you look at a film and it talks about, you know, a half a million workers. I mean, you know, and, and somebody said that, you know, the, the closest thing to a revolution in this country that has ever been seen, mm -hmm. and yet, I don't remember having even heard about this in school, and I, you know, I paid fairly close attention when I was in school. I don't, I didn't miss this chapter. Maybe, is it, I mean, does that strike anybody else as a little odd that nobody taught us about any of this? They might have been told not to teach it in school, you know. Uh, well, it's, uh, one thing's for sure, you know. uh, for that to happen, <coughs> the government was involved there. The government let this happen. Let, let what happened? The, but, the, the not teaching? Whatever happened in 1934, when oh. these people were killed yeah. Yeah. Uh, for doing something that was nothing they were doing wrong, mm -hmm. they were just asking for what they really believed in, mm -hmm. and uh, and the government allowed that to happen. Uh, that was kind of sad. Yeah. I mean, they they, they were exercising the rights that was supposedly were given to them by right. under yeah. the law. Right. Well, of course, well, like you say, you never heard about it. The only thing they were, you're taught anything is that they want you to know something. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they don't want to teach it to you. Mm -hmm. right? Well, these people the only way we find out is from word of mouth. Yeah. My father, uh, like I said, before the, that even started, I said that there's some people who killed him. Uh -huh. yeah. And he right. told me that. It hasn't changed much, has it, Tom? No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't no, in some ways. No. No. Really. When these people went back to work, I mean, Roosevelt, you know, they're supposed to go back and they're written off. They, they know if you're a union member. And, uh -huh. and the government, what did the government do? I guess they did something later, but. You know, they didn't do nothing at that uh -huh. time, and the, the law said that they, you know, and so they, I, I don't know if discrimination was mentioned, but they was to go back on their jobs. Mm -hmm. it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. so. what, uh, if, what I'm sorry, go Danny, ahead. what happened to us when we applied for work at Pratt and Whitney? Well, what happened to us? You know, yeah. you, Danny Britton, and me, Pete Lamonte. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a good. He just brought up a good question. <laughs> well, what happened? Want me to answer it? Well, I I applied at Pratt. Uh, and I did as well. Ten years ago, I think. Uh -huh. And as I was interviewed as a non, as a non they're non union plant, I was interviewed, and I told him you know, he liked what I did because I had past experience from soccer defense. And mm -hmm. In those days, it was Maryland. I had four years of, you know, machinery in the area. Yeah, good credentials. Grinding, yeah. did everything in there. And I was going down at that time thinking I'm going to prove myself. Of course, obviously it was wages. And their their first few questions was well. Uh, in the Bitterfield area, uh, soccer, soccer defense, uh, Bitterfield textile, and West Point Park were unionized. And uh, what's your feelings about a union? So, you know, right off the bat, they're asking me questions, you know, that they shouldn't have been asking me. Right. right? And I had, I had to tell from the heart and tell like it was that I said, some plants may be, may not do the union, but a lot of them do. And I says, and I says, Is it, you know, you have a contract. I told him my outright mm -hmm. how I felt about it, you know, and uh, he says uh, he asked me a couple other questions pertaining to unions, and I, and basically the whole interview was on unions. So I said, uh oh, I guess I'm not going to be hired here. <laughs> and guess what? You were right. You're right. You're right. They didn't care about your grinding experience. No, they didn't care what uh -huh. I did. No. And but and, and I will say this, in essence, they did me a favor, uh -huh. a real favor, yeah. because I wouldn't want to work in a non-union yeah. plant. Well, sure, but I mean, the point is, what we saw happen in 1934, you know, happened in the 1980s, and, yeah. Yeah. and why do I have this, why do I, why do I suspect it might even happen today in 1995, right? Yeah. Sure. I mean, mm -hmm. that's... Um, you know, one, the, there's some lessons I think out of this thing, which is oh, that sure. yeah, things are a lot different now. Films are in color now, yeah. but and they're still practicing with, with our place with them as a non-union shop. They're still trying to work hard to make sure people don't 
you know, they're trying to do everything they can to mm -hmm. keep, all, keep all the union or this man. Mm -hmm. What happened to that plant in Vermont that you uh, worked so hard to organize? We're still we're still fighting it. I mean, uh, but it, this is something you won, right? Sure. Uh, you know, yeah. people agreed for it and they went for it, and uh, you know, it, it it was a victory. Workers there, for you know, people who aren't familiar, workers there organized, voted for a union, used the labor board, all the rules right. that you're supposed to follow. They, you know, they work hard and play by the rules, like they say, right? And people voted for a union back on December 22nd. Today's June 20th, and the company has still refused to recognize the union, refused to bargain with the union, has basically said, you know, in your face, we don't care. We don't, you know, we are not well, going I, to... I, 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 she was probably one of the organizers. But... Yeah. Uh, what may, in your uh, own opinion, what do you what do you feel that it's holding it up? That's holding think, it up. Yeah, do you feel like it's uh, bureaucracy? Is it? Well, it's, it's just the the fact that the company <laughs> in this case, and this is not unusual, the company is able to essentially ignore the law. The penalties under the law are slow and pretty ineffective. I mean, we're still in you know the legal proceedings, and meanwhile, workers are being. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to undermine the support for the union. I mean, some people say, well, just like, it seems to me, just like in the film, they say, well, the union can't do anything. The problem must be the union. You know, the problem isn't the company. The problem must be the union. Well, the problem's been uh, since 1934 to 1995. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. And basically, because you really haven't really gotten forward here because uh, the laws are not strict enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the power is pretty, you know, sure. The law is taken away from you. Power and yeah, it's organized and everything. Well, one question that is in my mind about that is that what do you think the showing of a film like this can, can mean? I mean, to the extent that there's probably a lot of people who don't know much about their history or where they came from. I mean, I should just mention to our viewers you know, the five of you are pretty active in the union here. You're not just five, you know, guys off the street. You're pretty active workers in the union. You work at the mill, but you're active union member. And you know something about this, but not much of the detail. This is, you know, pretty much been history that's been covered up. What do you think the effect can be if people start looking at where they came from? I think they should show the film down yeah. south, where these people are just not uh, together as far as unions are concerned. Uh -huh. And I can I actually look at this film and see that it, most of it was down south, you know, and uh, here are the, their, their generation now in 1995, don't even, they probably don't even know yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, on the show that we did a couple of weeks ago with the producer, I mentioned we, sh we showed a little bit of the clip of this, mm -hmm. and we had George Stoney, who was the producer, on the phone with us. Uh, he was in New York, and he was talking about the making of the film. They took six years to make this thing, and one of the most difficult things was to get people to talk about it. You know, if you noticed, you know, there were a couple of scenes in the early part of the film. Remember the, the older couple was sitting on the porch and the older woman who was almost in tears saying, this is bringing up all those, yeah. all those bad things that we wanted to They were still afraid. They were, absolutely, they were sure. afraid of what had mm -hmm. happened. And, and uh, you know, the young woman at the very end who says, it's, you know, it's, it's long past time. I mean, she's the... Those are her parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she wants to get this story out and have this story be told. Um, my my guess is that there's a there are a lot of stories probably around here that haven't been told that people have, yeah. you know. Well, once they see something like this, they know that it's, uh, it's been a scare tactic anyway. It always has been mm -hmm. against unions. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll tell you that you're going to lose your job and all this. They're going to blackball you. And it's it's done today. Anybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't think that it hasn't been done today. He's uh, just kidding himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They really are. Mm -hmm. I need to ask Tommy a question if it's all right. Hmm? You saw the movie Schindler's List? Yeah. You know what it was like? It? Yeah, it was. Uh -huh. to it. Yeah, as far as I thought. You know how I many people like that? Yeah, yeah, it really was. Uh, yeah. It was kind of sickening yeah. to me. Yeah, it can happen something but, like but that. But you know, it's yeah. closely related. Or, it is. At least, you know, in my opinion, you know, I just, you know. That's upsetting to me, the thing that, uh, yeah, 58,000 men had died in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They turn over in their graves now to see what's going on mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Here it is, 1995. Mm -hmm. And most people still have to be scared whether to choose between having a little bit more money in their pockets, a little bit more uh, insurance benefits, 
It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't make yeah. any sense. And, and we have we got our own politicians that are helping us along, aren't they? Well, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, yeah, I guess I'd say that uh, you know I feel that uh, you know we're not getting the kind of support for you know workers' rights. I mean, for people to stand up. You know, these people took a lot of risks in standing up to fight for having a union, and and a lot of them you know suffered as a result. But but on the other hand, what do you think? What would have, where would we be today if they didn't, if they hadn't done this? If those people hadn't had the courage to stand up, 500,000 of them in that fight in 1934? There would have been a union, I don't think. I mean, essentially, they, what they did for us in those days, uh, you know, they, you know I, the, the union would have just been totally whitewashed if, if they had just give up on mm -hmm. the bat, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not, I know that because that was a big thing in those days. Uh, if you see, if you read through it enough, that if it wasn't for them. I think they they, they were a stepping stone mm -hmm. for the unions mm -hmm. to be organized, mm -hmm. and they proved it. And we wouldn't be fighting for our rights right now. Yeah, that's right. right. And you would I mean, have without them having gone first, without yeah. somebody. Yeah. Showing an example. Yeah. We set the example. Yeah. yeah. No question. But isn't it? Uh, I mean, when you think about how will people look back on us, you know, 50 years from now, and what do we do in this, you know, in the conditions we were faced with? Does it strike you that, you know, you got, you know, we have our own setup? But you know, when they look at it, they don't look at it as 1934, it was 1995, and they're going to look at it probably the same way. They're going to look at it the well, same way. Well, they look at it, uh, you know, yeah. we, we kept it going. Yeah, kept did, it yeah. Going. well, that's the question is, did, yeah. we, did we keep it going? Did, yeah, we, yeah, definitely. did we stand yeah, yeah. up and fight for it, or are, are we... I say, I say that uh, some of the people have done that. Uh -huh. But there's a, a majority, to me, Yeah. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Not in this yeah. I remember in, in Pennsylvania is probably one of the strongest states in union, mm -hmm. as far as unions were concerned. They're not the same today, mm -hmm. because all these steam mills are out. Sure. Mm -hmm. They've seen all this. It scares these people. Yeah. Yeah. But what do they do with it? Yeah. The federal government let this happen, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. They're behind it, 100%. Well, I, you know, I guess the question is sort of who's running the government, but, it, but I think that well, you know, this point one, in the film, you know, they're, they're, you've got the, the people who were the uh, owners of the mills who had, they clearly seemed to have a lot of the power in those towns, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. yeah. they pretty well... Management owned everything. Yeah, they owned the towns. Yeah, they owned the um, Churches, everything. Oh. Yeah. Well, let me Except ask a couple... the Catholic of... Church and, and uh, the Jewish, you know, they were big enough and worldwide so that, you know, uh, it was just little congregations started up by the company people. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think about the comment they made in there about the role that the church... The, the little churches played in the in the communities. Remember, they mentioned that. Sure. Yeah, it, it, it was, you know, uh, they were playing a mind game with the with, with the workers. Sure. Uh -huh. that, that was a yeah. bad thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I they should be thankful for what they have and not. Yeah, that don't was a, complain. That was a bad. Well, that was a good tool for yeah. them, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and, and there was there a lot of tools managed. they used. Let me ask you about another tool yeah, that they used it here. Yeah. There, there's a seems to me a tool that was used, and that's yeah. the 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 tool of race. Yeah. How did they? I mean, how did they deal with, with black workers versus white workers? I mean, how did... If they were on the outside, they had no... They, they, made they a, were just onlookers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they made them feel a, a little bit... machine, or they couldn't do... do just anything. a little bit lower than the, the person that was working in the mill. Uh-huh. Yeah, they were really discriminated yeah. against. <laughs> I mean, those poor guys, uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't have a chance. Yeah. But uh, well, the whites were permitted to run the machinery, whereas the blacks were not. Mm -hmm. Until they so, was organized, then the blacks... Kind of, you know, started, yeah. more freely. But, but I guess the question is, what impact do you think that had on the ability of workers to, to organize where they kept the, sort of the blacks and the whites, you know, sort of divided with each other, right? They're scrambling over the crumbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I guess we don't have a lot of experience with that in Maine, but it seems like it's obviously it's a pretty big issue in the South. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. We don't have much experience with that. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. you know. I mean, it's a tool that has yeah. been used mm -hmm. pretty, uh, pretty often by. I mean, you still had slavery in those days with the blacks, as mm -hmm. far as like they, we just mentioned. Well, they made the whites feel a little bit job. more superior <laughs> than the blacks. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. that's basically the yeah. South. That's the way. Right. Well, is that? I mean, we, you know, we talk about the South, but. Is is really the South that different than the rest of the country? I mean, how different is it in the South believe. than New England even? I don't believe that they're, they're, that's the point that, that they're different. Uh -huh. I believe it's probably the public 
handle it uh, in a different way compared to the politicians down here. Yeah. Fill up a slider or whatever. I think that's what the problem is. Uh -huh. I believe it's politicians, no matter how you look at it, that cause the problems here. Do you ever find there being here, in your own experiences in, in Maine, that there's any kind of, uh, I don't know, pecking order between different uh, ethnic groups within the mills? Uh, I mean, you know, mills are largely populated, you know, here at least from the 30s on, you know, by people coming down from Canada, right? I mean, maybe you're, mm -hmm. you are mentioned your parents and grandparents and so on. Yeah. I mean, is that, was there d discrimination against, you know, French Canadians in the mills here? Was that uh, prevalent? I don't think that was you. No? My no? in-laws came from Canada mm -hmm. to work here in the mills, and never no discrimination uh -huh. for that. It was more or less the mills that paid to have them come down here. Uh -huh. They brought been down here since 1968. Okay. There was friction between the uh, the Franco-Americans and the uh, the Irish people, uh -huh. and the the Italians and the Greeks, you know, mm -hmm. like that. But you know, as far as the company, you know, no. Yeah. I think there's only one Italian in Bedford. There was only one Italian. His name is Bob. Now there's two. Uh, that's true. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They supplied them. Back in those days, you know, they did supply them housing and everything. So uh -huh. I don't think they, like everybody says, they don't think they any discrimination yeah. as far as that goes. Yeah. But it does sort of work to the mill owner's advantage, though, wouldn't you say? I mean, it went, oh, yeah. if, if you got people sort of who are fighting with each other, whether it's Franco-Americans and Irish-Americans and or it's blacks and southern whites and so on, I mean, who who, who benefits from that? And well, the walks? company benefits no matter who's there. Whether Same thing black, as, you know, with the non-union uh, and the union people. It doesn't matter what nationality mm -hmm. you are, just mm -hmm. that you're a hard-working human being, that's what counts. Mm -hmm. And the company zero out on every one of us. Mm -hmm. so that's what people don't understand, that I don't understand why they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They zero on all of us. Yeah. It's not just one majority or anything. It's just all of yeah. us. <clears throat> you know, okay. Tom and I go round and round most every day, you know, with him being Italian and, and I being French, you know. Uh -huh. And uh but you know, we have an awful lot of respect for each other, you know. Uh name calling sure it, it goes on, you know, but I, I was telling him earlier, you know, uh, <coughs> I know when to draw the line and, and Tommy does too, uh -huh. you know. And, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of helps, you know. And then now we have uh, the southern people, you know. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, no supervisors, but no, our, our big boys, you know. Uh -huh. So we uh, kind of throw them a little, little bit of stuff, too. Uh -huh. you know? I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, they take it, that's all I'm saying, you know. I really like working for them. <laughs> you know, they're, they're good natured, you know, but they, uh -huh. they have to take it anyway. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like we're really with boss. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we have more experience. We know what we're doing, where so management just kind of just looks on. Mm -hmm. Well, they need you, right? I mean, they couldn't run yeah. it without you guys, right? Right. With, with their hands. Yeah. As they put it on the yeah. phone. Hired hands. Yeah, well, that's it. They hi hired yeah, hands. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Huh. You know, my doing a job as long as you're being treated fairly. Yeah. If you're being treated fairly, then everything's going. But when it's all one sided, mm -hmm. then that's when you mm -hmm. step back and you mm -hmm. look at the whole picture yeah. and say, what, what really is going well, on? Well, of course, that's, you know, the, the film, the context of the film was this was at the time of the Great Depression. So mm -hmm. things weren't, you know, everybody was scrambling, right? It was, the times, were, time, times yeah. were tough for everybody, and people were. People were hurting, seriously hurting, and you know, so you had this whole organization that was really happening at the grassroots. I mean, you think about how they organized a strike like that with all these different mills, and yeah, they didn't have fax machines and you know, computer modem hookups and get everybody online to talk about what we're all going to do. I mean, they they had to deal with you know some very hard problems of just transportation and communication, and yet you know they were able to build something that's bigger than anything we've seen in. Well, at least in my lifetime, I don't want to go back as long as Pete, but I would say in my lifetime, I haven't seen anything, you know, that, that approaches that kind of degree of organization. Mm -hmm. You see the lady from Fieldcrest in Canada, you know, they just, they had a heck of a time organizing Fieldcrest, as you know. Oh, absolutely. And, and they still, <clears throat> we're not talking 1934, we're talking about a few years ago, sure. right? And Fieldcrest has fought in the limit, even after they, I guess, I don't know if it was a time vote or something, but um, as far as organizing, yeah. but, but these people, had wicked hard times, you know. Sure. 
And finally, I guess he finally did get organized. No, actually, Fieldcrest still isn't. Still isn't. Fieldcrest Canada still, to that to this day, uh, hasn't been organized. It's and they spent millions of dollars to fight him. Yeah. Know, the, the company. You know. Oh, that's the whole thing. So, so here we are. We're still in 1934. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, just an it's area. It's money and politicians that keep us up. Yeah. You know, I was I had the opportunity to be down there at uh, at Cannon uh, in Kannapolis, North Carolina, back about ten years ago for one of the organizing drives that we did, and it really was. I mean, the, the company town. You, you know, we'd go out to house call people like you know you've done before. We go house call workers. Everybody worked for this mill. You, we wouldn't have to look up and go house call or find somebody's house. We literally would go door to door because everybody worked there. And uh, the uh, the interesting thing uh, was that. You know, the, the people there were feeling so controlled by the company, and people remembered this strike. I mean, this is like, I was there in 1985 mm -hmm. uh, trying to organize, and people remembered that something had happened, something bad had happened. They didn't know quite what, but the union, the union equaled trouble, equaled, you know, bad, equaled I don't want to talk to you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wonder what, what you think about that, about if people don't know the history and all they hear is sort of the little rumors about it. You know, what is, how, how does that leave people feeling about trying to change things? I don't think anyone's going to see it because these people today, uh, if they can't see what, uh, what's going on now, I mean, if they have to be hit in the head with a bat or something, whatever, to, to finally come out of work where they are at. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I don't think they really understand it. Yeah. They don't understand it. I mean, I've seen uh, uh, some of the shows up in Augusta. These people have fought and fought and fought uh, workmen's compensation and uh, 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 wage increase, mm -hmm. the minimum, minimum wage. wage yeah. I mean, what does the government get out of saying that five dollars an hour is enough? Come on. They're, they're saying five dollars an hour is too much. Too much. Oh, five, how, well, how did they figure it's too much? Who? I mean, if you, they were making six dollars an hour, yeah. they'd be able to take out more federal income tax on our mm -hmm. Of course, Uncle Sam loves that anyway. Mm -hmm. Mr. President and uh, his Congress, you know. What do you think about that? <laughs> you know, the American Red Cross is going through the same thing. You know, back in, in World War II, uh, you know, I solicited do donations for the American Red Cross as well. I'm not giving to the American Red Cross because you charge our soldiers five cents for the donuts. Well, that was in England during World War II. Now, our counterpart over there, which was the Red Shield, I believe, they were selling the donuts to their military. Well, we had to do, because we were a guest in that country, what they were doing. And yes, there was a price charge for the donuts, you know. Mm -hmm. The American Red Cross is suffering for it today, which is the same thing that happens about, well, you know, we've heard about strikes, strikes mm -hmm. are bad. Right. And, uh, you know, and uh, they need to be educated. Yeah. That's the key yeah. word. Yeah. Like, see, know? remember the woman at the, uh, almost at the very beginning of the show, the black woman, I think she's from Cannon Mills. Yeah. And she's sure. sitting there saying, you know, I've heard things, but I, and I want to know what's, I want to know the history of it. I want to mm -hmm. know yeah. what really happened here. And, and you, you get talking to some of the older women. I mean, there are some women in there who, you know, I mean, they were participants in that strike. They were leaders of that strike. And then, mm -hmm. you know, they're, you know, they're real proud of what they did then. It sounds like, you know, they they bottled us up for 60 years. But you believe that uh, that these people in 1995 are living the same history hmm. in yeah. 1934? Because they're being told the same thing. Oh, yeah? They're mm -hmm. being told, uh, you can't do this, yeah. you can't do yeah. that. And they, they scared these people. Yeah. Well, in fact, this scary. thing is so controversial. I mean, the, the, sh the showing of this film, uh, as you might imagine, is is pretty controversial down in South Carolina. In yeah, the, I the, would imagine. Yeah. They're not going to show it in our boardroom at, at West Point Stevens. No, that's for sure. You don't think they're going to no, do that, huh? No, no they're, they're not going to do that. We could suggest <laughs> to the company they might want to tune in. It's on public television. You know, we could suggest to them that they might want to tune in to Channel 10 on uh, next Tuesday yeah, night. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, but down in, in Carolina, well, might, yeah. <laughs> in, the, uh, in the town, in this town, Honeypath, yeah. where, you know, those, those workers were killed, the strikers were killed, yeah. they, they had a service on Memorial Day where they dedicated a monument to the six workers or seven workers who were killed mm -hmm. in that strike and they finally got the town to recognize what had happened and the significance of this event in American history and uh, really due to the efforts of uh, a couple of the people who appeared in the film they got the town to recognize this and as I say they had a, a big service and dedicated a monument and the newspaper did a big feature about what had happened back in 1934 
But still in all, there's a lot of you know, corporations that, have, uh, that, that don't want this sort of thing shown. And in fact, yeah, South Carolina, my, my, correct about the South Carolina Public Television is, is the only station in the country that's refusing to air the show. I mean, it's being aired all over the United States except in South Carolina. Do we have any mills in South Carolina? We do a law against that. Yeah, we do, don't we? A law against it? Any mills? Yeah, yeah. What law is that? Yeah, we get any. That's public information, isn't it? Well, I think most information is in private hands. No, it's not just hands in it. Well, I mean, who controls it, right? I forgot about that. Well, that really, I mean, this has been public information for 60 something years, but it's never been taught. It's never been talked about. Why? It's being controlled, isn't it? Well, by who? By the big big shots, uh, big uh, owners of these mills. I mean, they're the ones that started it in the first place. Yeah. But they, uh, what, I, what kind of shocks me is that they never turned that around and tried to blame the union for it. Well, in some well, ways, you know, they, they have. In some ways, see, you know, they, they thought they were really intelligent, but if they had turned that around, but when, when a story like this comes out, then these people think. Yeah. Now, if they had brought it out themselves, they probably wouldn't be such an impact, but it's probably an impact. Yeah. I hope it'll be an impact. I mean, mm -hmm. interestingly, I think it will be, yeah. this is going to be shown, the, the night it's going to be shown on Tuesday the 27th, uh, our show is probably airing now after Tuesday the 27th, but the, uh, it's just sort of coincidental that that's the opening night of our convention. Our union is, as you know, going to be uh, f merging with the ILG and forming a new union called Unite, mm -hmm. and the opening night of that convention which will include, you know, lots of southern textile workers and northern textile workers and so on. That's the night this thing is going to be shown around the country. So, um, you know, hopefully it'll get some, That's some more exposure, yeah. some impact. Get some impact, you know. Yeah. See, yeah, you know, like Tom was saying, <clears throat> the government and, you know, our elected officials and, and our labor board. You know, if you go back to 1981, when Reagan, 1980 was in, no, we, we went from uh, Democrat labor board people that lived, and it would obviously make, meet you halfway in a lot of you know, serious cases, you know, arbitration and all yeah. that, and, and fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. We've gone the last 14 years backwards because we've had Repub Republican officials in there that done literally nothing. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's like today a, a union doesn't stand a chance on rights for a person, whether it be arbitration or whatever, because it's just a, a, you know, a labor board. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just don't care about the workers. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, this has turned things around. This has hurt the union for the last 14 years, mm -hmm. from what I've seen. And uh, that's the sad part. This is why, unfortunately, some of our, our unions have got weaker, because, you know, we're here at Reagan Ox, what we've had the last 14 mm -hmm. years. It's just <laughs> totally hurt us. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's the way I've seen it. And unless we turn it around, like that film, and, and like Pete was saying, re-educate people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and then they're going to realize, hey, you know, this is what we have yeah. a union. This is yeah. what it's for. I mean, yeah. this is why you have contracts. Right. You know? People have gotten away from all that. Yeah. Well, you know, we've talked about the need to educate people, and particularly mm -hmm. younger workers coming in who don't know, I mean, the history. You guys know some history. And this film obviously exposes a lot of us to a whole lot more history than we ever got taught. And then we've got a whole lot of younger workers who are coming in who, you know, who, are, who really are very disconnected from the histories even that mm -hmm. you guys have lived through, right? Because it's, you know, it's may as well be long ago as far as they're concerned. Yeah, they have a job and, you know, yeah. they're concerned about it. Yeah. So, I mean, how can we use history? Right? How, how can we get stories told to people that are going to at least give them a better idea of where they came from, and you know where they're at right now. Through public, hopefully through our experience, mm -hmm. what we've been through on our job by working. Yeah, there, and how right, you need more shows like this, you know, where it's mm -hmm. more honesty. You know, yeah, where where it's really coming from. And you that, need all instead of coming from right from one source and not another source. Yeah, and you need well, working people in the middle, union members. Mm -hmm you know, reaching these people. Yeah. And that, that's whack. Yeah. See, you know, certain people like myself or Pete, a lot of us, Tom, you know, we, we're always in there speaking up for the union. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a couple of young gentlemen that joined the union recently yeah. through a grievance procedure yeah. or whatever that didn't understand yeah. the union. Like everybody's saying, yeah. nobody understands the union, yeah. right? But like you say, we've got to have a film like that and some access to get these people yeah. with it. Well, that's, you know, that's really what we're, 
uh, trying to do here is, is through the access of you know, public access television, be able to get working people to tell their own story. One of the things that is remarkable about this film, if you think about it, there was no narrator in that film. There was no voice off camera explaining mm -hmm. anything. It was all said through the words of the people themselves. Mm -hmm. Either the people, the older workers who were there back in the 30s, or their children and grandchildren, but there was nobody. The plant owners, and yeah. Yeah, and, and we, you know, the interviews uh, of plant owners and, uh, and, okay. and some of the church people and so on. Uh, that's at least my idea, and I, and I know from talking to George Stoney, the producer of the show, what he's very much interested in is seeing that we, you know, working people, use things like this show and this camera and this opportunity to tell stories, to tell your own stories. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess I'd like to ask if there's, you know, when you think about, you take a look at a film like this, do you think about stories of, from your own past or your own experience or your own, your own family's experience that, that aren't really known that maybe ought to be, you know, told? Mm -hmm. I mean, Pete, I remember, and I don't want to put you in the spot, but I remember you told me the story a few months ago about, I think it was your, your grandmother? Yeah, grandmother, yeah. yeah. Could you, would you mind sharing that with us? I mean, sure. Uh, it was during the contract negotiations and I had had an opportunity to uh, spend a little time with Mike, and, and uh, he was asking me questions about, uh, you know, my ancestry as far as who worked here and uh, and then I, uh, the best thing I could come up with, uh, uh, my grandmother worked here, and uh, I believe it was 1926, I did research it. Uh -huh. uh, she was killed here at uh, West Point Pepperell. And uh, it was in uh, the 13-2 area, where they used to have these great big leather belts that was run by the power, you know, from, from water power. Uh -huh. And in a spring runoff, the belts would go a lot faster. Uh, you know, they had so means of controlling them, but you know, once in a while they went out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the belts broke, and it hit her on the side of the head, and she was brought home that day. Uh, the following day, she, she passed away uh, from the injuries sustained at, at, at the mill. And, and back then, you know, uh, 1926, the company, you know, a representative from the company came to the house, well, they checked for the amount of $26, which was a, an awful lot of money back then. And he gave this to the family. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it progressed from there. Mm -hmm. you know, so, it's just part of history. You know? yeah. yeah. And, and you know, history that a lot of people, I mean, it just made, it, made an impression. It was a personalized story of, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, you sort of know that people have literally suffered and died building, mm -hmm. you know, the industry, building the union. Um, and unless people actually talk about it and put a name and a face and a person with it, it doesn't seem as powerful. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Which I think is really why this film is is popular. When you have people telling their own story like that, um, it makes it it makes a difference. I was told in 1936, I think, by Don Millet also, that somebody had died uh, organizing. You know, they were on strike, mm -hmm. and uh, somebody had. I don't know if he gets shot or something, but he get, he died. Mm -hmm. This this was all within labor rights, you know, mm -hmm. trying trying to organize. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that I mean that that did happen most yeah. days up here. Yeah. So it wasn't just yeah. on the south. Yeah. When I was uh, researching, you know, the story about my grandmother, you know, uh, in talking with my father, he says, yeah, and he says her brother also died. He fell in one of the starch vats, you know, that we used to have down there. Uh, remember the starch vats that they, they were talking about? It, it, yeah. uh, it was for the sheeting part, you know, yeah. and he had fallen into one of the vats, you know, which was my grandmother's brother, you know, so that both, you know, passed away uh, yeah. from injuries at the mill, yeah. you know. Well, and you see, you know, um, you know, people who, you know, families have suffered through this and, and, you know, the families that we saw in the film have suffered through it. Yeah. You know, there's some people, some, some of them who might want to just want to forget about it, and I think that was you know, largely true of the people down in, in Honey Path and other parts of the South who wanted to yeah, sort of, it was, it was there. you know, forget what had happened that, you know, it was, all it caused was trouble. But when people finally started being able to talk about it, you see a lot of them feel proud of the fact that they stood up 
and fought. And I think, Sharon, you know, you were making the point earlier that if they hadn't, even though on, by some measures they lost that strike, a lot of people lost their jobs, some people lost their lives, and a lot of people would say, well, of course it wasn't worth it, you know, but a lot of those people say it was. It was worth it, because mm -hmm. if they hadn't, it wasn't just for, for the time, it wasn't just for themselves that moment, it, but it was something that was actually being done for the benefit of generations that, you know, they hadn't yet met and never would. I've told Danny, you know, time and time again, I pay you and your dues for what I've gotten, you know, not for what I plan on getting in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of my way of, you know, my contribution of paying back. Mm -hmm. And I've told Danny this, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, I, it, it doesn't bother me at all to pay my union dues. I'm thinking about it that way, mm -hmm. you know. For all, you know, the hardships endured by, you know, the people that have yeah. preceded me. Yeah. I think it's all. It's, a, it's an interesting way to look at it. It's also looking at it in terms of, you know, we're making an investment for the future of right. maybe not ourselves, but, you know, our, our kids or, you yeah. know, who's ever going to follow us. Um, and I think that's really the way in which this, this film is offered. This film is offered not just as a way of looking back at something interesting that happened in the past, but really what, you know, what can be learned from this. How, how, do, how this, do you feel about the workman's compensation law today? How do I feel about the workers' compensation law? Yeah. I feel like it's uh, it's not as uh, protective of workers as it ought to be. I mean, you know, well, when you say that, what do you mean by that? Well, that the uh, they they made it so difficult for workers to access the system that a lot mm -hmm. of people basically get get cut out. Who, who so like you're saying, if somebody gets hurt on a job and it takes them five years to even uh, yeah. start to collect any type of right. benefits or anything? I mean, in a case like that, yeah, I think it's. You know, that's obviously has moved us mm -hmm. back the wrong direction. Tommy and I were talking about that. You get hurt today, yeah. you know, you better have yeah, some yeah, bucks. As much yeah, as you better have a lot of money as a real insurance. A year or better. Yeah. If you don't have any other access to money, you're yeah. Yeah. But right. at least we have, you know, we have avenues that we can take, mm -hmm. which we didn't yeah. have before. Yeah. We've seen some yeah, people suffer because they have all the little right in the middle. Sure. Because they don't get any of the money comes in as well. Well, I mean, that's. That's one of a whole lot of issues that I think that I think face us, and I guess I just and I know we're we're sort of running out of time with this show, but I think, you know, the because they mentioned that, uh, you know about not having any benefits back then. Workers' yeah. comp is one of them, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, workers' insurance, they call yeah, it. Unemployment insurance, yeah. you know, <laughs> strike benefits, and things benefit. that we have now <coughs> that didn't. Well, come it seems to me they've called it back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know what every what, what these people fought for. Yeah. It's being called back now. A lot of it is. And uh, I believe that. If the people don't realize this, it's going to be too late. Yeah, sure. Call back to being we're roll losing. back, roll back to where it used to be. Roll right back to where uh, oh. they were. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, they, people don't know it. I think your point is if people don't know the right. history, yeah. they're going to find themselves back there and, and wake up someday and not, yeah. you know, not realize it. You think you'll be able to turn the general generation around today? No, yeah. it's not me. It's a question for all of us, right? I mean, I think we're all going to try it. Doesn't yeah. mean that it's going to succeed. Well, we gave them a good taste of the, you know, the past negotiations we had with government. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You, you, gotta, you, you do what you can do. I think at the time, if you, if they'd asked those strikers back in 1934, you know, do you think you're going to win? Is it, you know, you guaranteed you're going to win? I don't think people knew, but I think a lot of them felt like they did what they had to do, yeah. and. Was curved, you know. Yeah, a lot uh, of you find that lacking today. Yeah, the courage is yeah. isn't there. Yeah, that's also scared. scared the younger generation more they scared me. They, 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 well, that's, that's because they're being scared. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of different yeah. ways than back yeah. in 1934. Yeah. Today, you got more technology today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I think that this, you know, film hopefully, open, you know, helps to open some eyes and open some uh, open some discussion and. and I, I hope you'll encourage people to see it. We'll uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about. It. Tommy and I have coffee every morning, and, and that's okay. what we'll talk about. That'd be know? that'd be great. Appreciate you guys along. And I, I want to thank you all for spending the afternoon here in the in you, our uh, air conditioned studios. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mike. Okay. And uh, with that, I want to thank our guests for tuning in. And uh, if you've not had a chance yet to see the Uprising of '34 on public television, we'll look for uh, look for reruns of it, and we'll do our level bus during Kavanaugh's Corner to see to it that. Uh, the film is more widely distributed than the state of Maine. So, thank you all for tuning in. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. And that will wrap it up. <laughs>